I mean, I think you just gave my talk for me, so we, we, we can be done, right? So I'm Luke, uh, founder and CEO of Stadium Apps, and I w am here to share what's probably my favorite project of the eight years of Stadium Apps. Um, like Ilya was saying, I knew about Stadium Maps long before I started Stadium Apps, and their base tiles were all throughout my projects before I had a company, and the chance to bring that into our platform was really, really cool. So just a little bit about Stamen. Um, they are a design firm primarily focused on data and cartography. Uh, they've been around for almost 25 years. And pretty much if you have used OpenStreetMap tiles in a commercial setting anywhere, Stamen's fingerprints are somewhere on that. Um, if you look at a lot of the map styles from the last 20 years dealing with OpenStreetMap, they've had a very significant um, influence on that. I even looked at some of our own styles and realized they originally stemmed from Stamen uh, work many, many years ago. Uh, Stadium Maps, we do location APIs for developers. We help companies put location in their product, especially companies that are not geospatial focused. Uh, we focus on being private, affordable, and give a human touch to support so you can get the job done without too much hassle. So the Stamen map tiles. Um, the, they're really composed of three styles, three style families. Actually, within these families, there's a lot of different variants. Um, most people have seen watercolor and don't know what it is, but really like it. And then there's kind of more traditional map uh, cartography uh, in toner and terrain. Um, they were created more than 10 years ago. Uh, at the behest of the Knight Foundation, which is a nonprofit focused on creating tools for journalists to create good journalism. So they actually have a, uh, a history in being used as tools for uh, newspapers, particularly in digital media. But one really cool thing that's happened since then is because water cooler, watercolor is such a fantastic map um, art piece, it's actually now part of the Smithsonian Design Museum in New York. And I had a chance to see that. Uh, and it's really cool to see a map full screen on the wall that you get to interact with. It's something that I've never seen of one of my own maps. So what was the problem? Everyone loved the Stamen base maps. Why change? Um, it really came down to a few things, uh, primarily cost. Um, Stamen base maps were free for 10 years. And I don't know how many of you run a tile service, but the costs add up really, really quickly. Um, they were spending thousands of dollars a month just to maintain this free service and had no way to make any money from it. Um, and at some point, the budget just wasn't there anymore. Then when you look at some of the styles, there were a lot of missing tiles. Um, actually, all the styles, there were missing tiles on, on their service. And the data was old. Uh, so we're talking, this is OpenStreetMap data from maybe 2014, 2015. And if any of you have looked at the changes in between in the last 10 years of OpenStreetMap, there's a lot more data. It's a lot better. And it just wasn't reflected in the statement tiles. And at the end of the day, they needed to turn the service off, but they didn't want it to go, uh, just go away. So that's where we come in. Uh, they approached us last year and wanted to see what we could do together. And because we're all about open source and open data, um, we worked together to create the brand new Stamen map styles. Um, this is actually just, we only recreated toner and terrain because watercolor is impossible to recreate in current modern map rendering stacks. And I actually have a little bit about that later. Um, pretty typical um, open data sources, OSM, Natural Earth, the EU land covers built in, and because it's a Stamen style, there's no island somewhere in there. Again, most of you know the, the software already. Um, open map tiles is the, the style schema we've used for a long time. Uh, map Libre, the map rendering, and then lots of things that we added as glue pieces to make it work. The styles themselves are open license. Um, you can use them yourself for non-commercial projects, and eventually those will be fully uh, open license, so anyone can use them for any purpose. So I want to talk a little bit about the challenges and, and success of the project. Um, first, it seems like a very technical project, and there were technical challenges and, of course, cartographic challenges. But some of the biggest challenges were actually organizational things, like how do we 
talk about this to a developer community that's formed over the last 10 years. So when you have something for free on the internet, it gets used. And when it gets used for 10 years, everyone knows about them and everyone uses them. And there were probably millions of users of the statement base maps in the last 10, 15 years. And these users were just using a URL. We didn't know their emails. We didn't know anything about them. So the first thing we had to do is how in the world do we tell all these people that things are changing? And then on top of that, we have to tell them, sorry, but this free thing is now going to cost you a little bit of money. And this is a huge number of projects. It's not just one with millions of users. It's probably thousands of projects with a few hundred users each or even more. Um, so pretty early on, we realized the biggest challenge here is not going to be the technical recreation of the map. It's actually going to be telling everyone it's changing. So we started really early on, I think probably three or four months before any change was coming. We started publishing blog posts. We started talking about it everywhere we could so that hopefully people would uh, discover what was going on. Um, we also came up with this cool idea of replacing the tiles with what we called our, our um, brownout tiles. So as we started the transition after we had done the cartography work, every other tile would start being replaced, or every 16th tile would be replaced with this little filled tile that said, this is what's happening, go to this website to find out more. So anyone who was using the maps would slowly find out things are happening. And we changed that from like every 16th tile to every eighth tile to every second tile, and eventually the entire map was just this uh, brownout tile to tell people things are changing. And that actually worked surprisingly well. Um, people eventually found out my map is broken, um, and most of the users that could transition did. The technical challenges were many. Um, like I said, this has been around for 10, 15 years, so a lot of people were using them, so we're talking thousands of tile requests every second, and we needed a way to, to handle this influx while we were doing it. Um, it's not actually three styles. Like I said, it's actually about 10 separate styles. And we wanted to support all of those. And if any of you have dealt with raster um, rendering of maps, that means for every single style um, variant, you have to render something else. So it gets really complicated really fast to, to keep the caches warm and things like that. And unfortunately, a technical decision was made many years ago when they added support for HTTPS. Uh, they actually used a domain that was not controlled by Stamen. So we could automatically um, handle the non-secure traffic, the insecure traffic. But when the secure traffic hit um, the uh, tile endpoints that they were using, it was actually a fastly controlled domain. So there was no way for us to cleanly transition those tiles without continuing to pay fastly for, fastly is a, a CDN provider. Um, continue paying them for every single request. Um, we could make it a redirect request, but we still had to pay for uh, the redirect uh, request. So we ended up having to just turn those URLs off. And we think that most of the users we lost was actually because those tiles just went away, and there was no way for us to tell, tell them that the tiles were moving. Um, a fun technical challenge in the terrain style especially was there's lots of data that goes into it. There's the base map data, um, streets, uh, cities, etc. There's lots of land cover information you need. So that's where the EU land cover data set came in. And then you also, it included hill shading. So we had to include um, elevation data. And we ended up having a lot of fun making our tile server do that really efficiently. And it ended up working quite well. Um, lots of traffic, if you can see down here at the bottom, uh, when we Sh turned on the redirect from statement map tiles to our, um, like the old base maps, to our implementation of the base maps, because that's how we started. Um, we ended up almost doubling uh, tile traffic instantly. And, and that was a fun night. But I, I think it actually worked pretty well. I don't remember any error spikes or anything, so that was fun. Like I said, terrain needed all kinds of data inputs, and we had to solve that, including no Island which is a fun uh, statement Easter egg. 
which for the technical among us, uh, we ended up solving this by using an MB tiles locally. So there's a MB tiles file with a single tile just for Null Island uh, in all the statement uh, tile sets. A few cartographic challenges came along, um, definitely less than the other ones. Um, MapLibre as a renderer is quite nice to use. Uh, Stamen was very comfortable using that uh, style language. Um, but we did run across a few things. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the land cover uh, in a second. Um, fonts were a surprising thing. Uh, they had really originally used Helvetica in the toner styles. And font licensing is impossible. Uh, you go to a font licensing website and you ask for, how can I get a license for I don't know how many users in a, in a map, and they usually just look at you and say, what is this? Um, so we ended up finding a free font we could use. And of course, transitioning an old style with old uh, data schema to a brand new one meant they meant Stamen had to go through and find a lot of um, just changes and understanding what data is there and what isn't, and how has it changed. And so there's a lot of work, especially at the end, to to reclassify things and give it the same look and feel. But it, when you actually look at the before and after, it ends up being very, very similar, uh, which I think is uh, a testament to the modern rendering stack and uh, how good it is. So like I said, land cover was really tricky. Um, this was particularly tricky because at the lower zoom levels, when you're zoomed out, we're using the EU land cover data, which and then when you zoom in, we're using OpenStreetMap land cover data. And when you look at the two tiles, two data sets, they actually don't overlap one to one. So you have to figure out how in the world do we merge these two um, and create a good look and feel. Um, the original had way less land cover, as you can see here on the right. And on the early draft, there was way too much land cover. So we ended up finding a way to like mess with transparency and find a really good uh, seamless result as you zoom in and, and switch between the two uh, land cover uh, data sets. Just another example of the same problem, how it had to be solved uh, across the, the US there. And st like I said, Stamen loved Helvetica. Um, but they ironically discovered they thought they were using Helvetica for this tile set the entire time, but they weren't. They were actually using Arial. Um, so we ended up deciding the font doesn't actually matter. It's really just a state of mind. So we can use Enter, which looks surprisingly similar. And as you can see, uh, we can't even tell which is which unless you know. So what you really came here for, the before and after, um, run through these uh, images quickly. And as you can see, overall, things really maintained a, a similar look and feel. We don't feel like we lost too much in the transition. And in some ways, there was gain fidelity because vector tiles can render a lot better on, on retina displays. And you can see even in some of these images the, the additional clarity that you didn't have before. Toner, I believe that's somewhere in London. And you can see even here in this image the advance of OpenStreetMap data. You're starting to get building footprints in places that never were 10 years ago. And even the road network itself is, is better uh, maintained. Uh, lower Manhattan. So that's what we were able to accomplish. Um, this took about, uh, I think, two or three months of work between the organizational and cartographic work and implementation on our side. But the one thing we left out was watercolor. Like I said, you can't do that with the current vector uh, map rendering. Um, but there's been a little bit of movement. Um, for those of you who follow MapLibre, there's a company that works with us a lot on the native side that um, has a few ideas of how we could do uh, watercolor rendering inside of MapLibre, and we're really excited to see if that's possible. We'd love to recreate watercolor, because the, the current style we host is still the old data from 10 years ago, and there's lots of missing tiles. Um, if you go to the talk uh, page, there's actually the link to this blog post, where it talks about how we could integrate uh, Photoshop-level image processing in MapLibre to create uh, MapLibre style. And I personally would love to see that. We would love to continue iterating on the, the technical and cartographic 
uh, styles. This is not um, an end state. We want to keep working on it um, and then use Stamen's insights to improve our own data schemas and our own product. So that's it. Thank you all. So, any hands? <laughs> Thanks a lot for the presentation. First, I'm a fan of watercolor here. <laughs> Just uh, um, wondering, what is the EU uh, global land cover exactly? Is it Urban Atlas? Is it Korean land cover? And how did you uh, use it outside Europe? But that was not clear. If you only relied on OpenStreetMap or you, you did something in between. Thanks. Uh, so the EU land cover, what we're using is that there's a product produced from uh, Sentinel data uh, called World Cover. And it's, uh, I think it's uh, 10 or 100 meter resolution land cover classification for the globe. Uh, so we took that, we processed it, turned it into vector data, and used that as the basis for land cover. We end up reclassifying quite a few of the covers because they, they get quite detailed. Uh, but that's, that's where that's from. Yeah, it's global and it's, it's freely licensed. Thanks, anyone else? Like, look, uh, as far as I know, MapTider provides like satellite imagery in tiles. Do you know how that works? Can that help in watercolor tiles? So watercolor is, you're asking about watercolor, right? Yeah, I, I mean, like I saw satellite imagery being packaged into vector tiles. Does it work? I, I've never seen that particular thing, but basically what happened, yeah, oh, it's raster. Raster. No. Oh, it's yeah. not. Like, I mean, uh, as, you, as you mentioned, like if MapLibre uh, can somehow uh, have the functionalities of Photoshop, then I think we are up for something really good. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you actually have to render different layers completely separately, run them through filters, and then stack that together. So what you end up is with like a intermediate, like you use the vector data to create an intermediate set of raster layers, process them off screen, and then layer them together. Um, I mean, if you look at the original statement code, it also does a lot of post-processing of textures and, and things like that, so. Anyone? A quick comment about uh, watercolors. So uh, there has been a lot of discussions and a lot of desire to have this functionality, but we're basically missing two key components, funding and volunteers. So if you can find someone around you who can either do the technical work or who has too much money in their pockets, do let us know. We'll take both um, and we'll get we will be very happy to accept uh, any kind of code and or financial donations in this target because, I mean, it's clearly needed. It has a lot of really hard problems to solve in terms of technical difficulties because, I mean, performance, you can, you can imagine how much performance would collapse because of this kind of functionality. So it has to be done very carefully not to sacrifice performance. And let's get it done. And I know that Stamen would love to recreate this in a modern stack. And we would too, so. So did this transition uh, bring additional revenue, or is it just a vanity project? Yes. 